Suborbital mission finally has a launch date, May 2nd. But on April 12th, NASA receives stunning news. The Soviet Union puts a man into orbit and brings him back alive. Cosmonaut Yuri Gagarin becomes the first man in space just 20 days before Shepard is scheduled to fly. We were all very angry about not being able to fly as quickly as we could have, and we would have beaten Gagarin into space had we done that. I was not pleased at all. He was very disappointed that he was not to be the first spaceman. And I was hoping for my friend Alan Shepard, beyond a hope, that he would be first. And it tears you up to know he could have been. Yet many milestones lie ahead. The space race has only just begun. John Glenn said, let's face it, they beat the pants off of us. Now let's all go on and let's learn how to fly in space. 23 days later, May 5th, 1961, 2.40 a.m. Shepard's pre-flight medical after three days of delays, the final countdown has begun. He was a cool cat. But Alan Shepard was an educated daredevil. Everybody was praying Alan could survive in space. It was very exciting, very frightening to see a man come out of the trailer that he was in, to look up at that vehicle, ride the elevator up and then wait for us to get ready to launch. 5.21 a.m. Technicians strap him into the capsule. Until the hatch is opened again, Shepard's only link to the world is Deke Slayton, the mission's Capcom or capsule communicator. Downrange in the Atlantic, the Navy prepares for Shepard's recovery. 45 million Americans watch the launch live on television. Local beaches offer a front row seat. Everybody, including myself, came here. We came any way we could. The excitement here. If you can imagine a million people outside these gates trying to push through these fences, trying to see what they can see. Everybody was praying and pushing for Alan Shepard. TM is a go. Uh, we have a, a momentary hold. As the countdown progressed, we had frustrations, they had problems with the spacecraft hatch. And Alan Shepard was, was getting impatient. Four hours later, Shepard is losing his cool. You could see Alan Shepard's heart rate go up and it reached above 200. Lord knows what my heart rate was. There's nothing wrong with being frightened. It makes you do a better job. But no one at Mission Control wants to give the final go for launch. All of us were extremely apprehensive. We had never had a human being on the top side of a rocket. It's Alan Shepard who decides they've waited long enough. Finally, he says, let's light this candle. Let's go. T minus 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5. He had one single line prayer, he said, just before ignition. One. Don't mess this up. But he didn't say mess. All right, uh, lift off and the clock has started. It was sort of like the first hit in a football game. When that Mercury Redstone rose above the tree line, cars stopped. People got out, hit their knees, and literally prayed. We saw that guy go, and we could track him for about the first 20 seconds as he went up through powered flight and then back down at the consoles and look at the data and listen to the calls. Pressure is holding at 5.5. Kevin holding at 5.5. Pressure is holding at 5.5. Kevin holding at 5.5. He 
is disappearing, here is a man going over a hundred miles in space. He looks so lonely up there. This is okay. Five minutes after liftoff, Alan Shepard becomes America's first man in space. Shepard's suborbital flight reaches 116 miles above the Earth, then descends. Uh, okay. Okay, this is Freedom 7. I want fly by wire going to re entry attitude. Uh, five, four, three, two, one. Chart retro sequence in retro attitude, hard green. Retro 1. NASA still fears the high G-forces or extreme temperatures of re-entry could kill him. Retro 3. Okay, three retros have fired. Retro jettison is back to arm. There is no question. We, uh, <laughs> we, uh, we were sweating uh, bullets. Okay, go. All systems are go. All right, all systems are go. Okay, we're going to have to go As expected, Mission Control loses radio contact with Shepard during re-entry. Mission control, we're absolutely helpless. Happiest 20 minutes of our entire life. Just the water, a moment ago, a chairman up from the ship company watching here from all decks on the aircraft carrier. I think he proved without a question in anybody's mind that man indeed could perform almost any task in a spacecraft. This was our first man in space. And it was total joy. The excitement of it, that has never been matched. When Alan Shepard went, it was the unknown. It was the unknown. Just 20 days later, President John Kennedy sets a new goal for America's space program. I believe that this nation should commit itself to achieving the goal before this decade is out of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the earth. This young president of ours gets up and says, we're going to go to the moon and we're going to land there and we're going to bring the people back home within the decade. I was staggered, or stunned, or overwhelmed by the scale of the challenge. The first American has barely reached space, and NASA still hasn't put a man into orbit. But the countdown to the end of the decade has begun. We had the knowledge, the moxie, and the will to not only catch up, but surpass and beat them in the business of spaceflight. NASA wants to put another man into space in a hurry to prove Shepard's mission was no fluke. 
they figure Gus Grissom is the engineer, so Gus will make the second flight, and he'll be looking at our engineering question. Ten weeks after Alan Shepard's flight, Gus Grissom is ready for a second suborbital mission. Shepard is Grissom's Capcom. Yeah, don't you just can't help but look out that way. I understand. 